back Stampeders to ECG Stampede. This is conference number three. I'm Ben. I'm John. And what's significant about that number three, John? Uh, three may possibly <laughs> be the correct number of fascicles that we have. Very good. Would you like a chance at redemption? Can you tell me what those fascicles are? Yeah, I'm going to tell you that after I explain to all of our listeners Please do not record and text at the same time. You will miss what is being asked of you and answer incorrectly oh, for all dangerous. of the world to hear. Yeah, you can get arrested for something. Three like that. fascicles. Three. The right bundle branch, the left anterior fascicle, the left posterior fascicle, and for some folks out there, the mysterious fourth fascicle. <laughs> it's an anatomic variance. Yeah. You know. Cannot exclude fourth fascicle <laughs> correlate clinically. Yes, please. <laughs> Shall we get started? Let's get started. Okay, this was a 49-year-old female that presented with weakness. Why don't you go for it, John? Sure. So this looks to be a sinus rhythm at about 100, give or take. Uh, the axis is uh, a little bit leftward leaning, uh, and our intervals appears to be a normal, uh, narrow complex QRS, um, and the QT maybe is borderline long, but doesn't look terribly long. Uh, in terms of ischemia, I don't see any really significant ST elevations, except for maybe an AVR. Uh, I do see some perhaps ST depressions in the uh, lateral leads, the high lateral leads. Um, and that T wave morphology doesn't look totally symmetric to me. Um, so possibly consistent with LVH, but we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, in a little bit. Uh, and the other thing that really stands out to me on this EKG is the uh, T-wave morphology in particularly V1, V2, V3, um, and the anterior precordium. Those look pretty uncomfortable to sit on. Ooh, yeah, that, those are peaked. So overall, um, I think this looks like sinus tachycardia with some underlying LVH. Uh, with a concern for possibly hyperkalemia. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so uh, there's s several features that are really like good teaching points on this ECG. One, the first thing you mentioned was you think that, you know, there's a little bit of left axis deviation. There's these asymmetric T waves out laterally. There's some big complexes. So this could be LVH, and I, I think it is, and it meets criteria for LVH. The criteria is pretty i mean it's it's fairly specific if you see it it's probably lvh not super sensitive only about 50 percent sensitive for just about any of the criteria but one of them is if avl is greater than or equal to 11 millimeters then that's lvh so yes avl is greater than or equal to 11 and you see these st depressions out laterally and then John was talking about the asymmetric T wave inversions. It's kind of this uh, biphasic T wave that goes down first and then up. And LVH can do that. It can go in, in the lateral leads specifically, not in the anterior or right precordial leads, but in the lateral leads, it can give you these T waves that go down first and then up and they, they appear very asymmetric. So I'd say all of those changes to me seem very consistent with LVH. And then you mentioned the peaked T wave, especially in, in V2. It looks that's really peaked. Um, remember that hyper or I'm sorry, peaked T waves do not always need to be super large. Like not all these are large, but you can tell that the base looks really narrow and the top looks really pointy. So those really are peaked T waves. QRS is a little bit wide, which may be this patient's baseline. I don't know. I have an old one to compare to, but this was indeed LVH and hyperkalemia. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, nice case. Next. Next. All right, so here we have a 19-year-old gentleman who came in complaining of pleuritic and positional chest pain. What do you think? Okay, well, rate's pretty tachycardic, like around 140 or so. And the rhythm looks to be sinus. Uh, no, it's definitely science. There's P for every QRS, QRS for every P. The only reason I pause is because the axis is a little bit strange. The P wave is down going. The P wave axis specifically is down going in one. So 
that's a little peculiar and then it's it's up in AVR and that's not normal either but the so maybe it's not sinus but it's at least atrial I would say and uh, now we're on axis so the axis there appears to be downgoing in one and a little bit kind of like isoelectric and AVF I'll call this a right axis deviation so there's a right axis deviation and the intervals look pretty normal except for I would say the QT actually looks a little bit short to me and then I do wonder if maybe that's what's going on here in the inferior leads because sometimes a short QT can give you the appearance of ST elevations just because that T wave kind of fuses with the QRS complex uh, there's also some really kind of gnarly Q waves in the inferior leads Kind of a strange looking EKG, uh, but in terms of signs of ischemia, I do see some ST elevation specifically in the inferior leads, maybe out here laterally a little bit also in V5 and V6. And then I know something else that's very peculiar about the size of the QRS complexes as you go across the precordium. Johnny, you want to speak about that a little bit? Yeah, so as we go across the precordium, it looks like the size of the QRS complexes are actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. uh, which is atypical. Typically, as we get further uh, further laterally from V1 to V6, we see those QRS complexes getting larger and larger because we're getting a better look at the left ventricle. And, and it seems like that's the opposite yeah. of what we're seeing here. Yeah, and there's kind of these peculiar Q waves out here in V6, but V6 is... I think predominantly upgoing. It's pretty close. It may be a little bit isoelectric, but it's predominantly upgoing. And then AVR is also upgoing. Anytime V6 and AVR are upgoing, or going in the same direction, I should say, you really ought to think about limb lead reversal. But the thing that's not typical for limb lead reversal is that decreasing QRS uh, amplitude size as you go across the precordium. That does not happen with limb lead reversal. There's also this right axis deviation and the, the strange P axis. So what do you think is going on? So, uh, yeah, I agree with all of that. I think this is less likely limb lead reversal. And I think this patient potentially has dextrocardia. Very good. Yeah, he had dextrocardia. And uh, we, we knew that because my auscultation is 100% sensitive and specific. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah, my chest x-ray was also. Oh, yeah, well, there may have been a chest x-ray involved, too. Um, so he had dextrocardia, but it doesn't necessarily explain these ST elevations in the inferior leads. And what you can do with someone with dextrocardia is literally just reverse all of the leads, and you'll get a normal appearing ECG like you would expect with a normal P wave axis and um, you know QRS axis and, and all that sort of thing. So that's what ended up happening in this patient. But... The ST elevation of the inferior leads persisted. If you think about two and three, those are 90 degrees from each other going inferiorly. So in a normal 12 lead ECG that you get in someone with dextrocardia, these are just, you know, two is three and three is two. Does that make sense? Yep. So the inferior leads still have ST elevation and you can't ignore that. This patient actually went on for a cath. He had a clean cath. And what was the ultimate diagnosis? Uh, he was diagnosed with myopericarditis. He, uh, he had some troponin leak uh, at his initial presentation. Uh, it went up a little bit further from there, but quickly plateaued and then decreased. Uh, unfortunately, he actually signed out of the hospital before he got his cardiac MRI. Um, but his uh, working diagnosis and, and final discharge diagnosis was myopericarditis. Yeah, that cardiac MRI could have really clinched the diagnosis, but uh, it sounds like that's what was going on. So that's yeah. what he was ultimately diagnosed with. Yeah. Cool case. Next. Really cool case. Yeah. All right. So this is a 63 year old male with a history of lung cancer who came in complaining of dizziness. What do you think, John? Uh, so when I look at this, I look at the rhythm, uh, excuse me, the rate, the rate looks normal to me. Uh, it looks like a sinus rhythm. Uh, overall, uh, the PR interval looks normal. The QRS is probably close to normal, maybe borderline. Um, the QT, though, does appear to be abnormal to me. It looks kind of short. Yeah. I'm kind of marking some of these, yeah. like in V4, V5, V6. Where the, yeah, the start they all of the, look pretty short. The start of the T wave sometimes blurs into the, the QRS complex. I think you see it almost best in lead three, or in the inferior leads in general. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, in terms of sinus ischemia, I don't really see much there. Uh, overall, I think this is just a sinus rhythm with a short QT. And then how about the QRS complex? Is that narrow, wide? I think it's borderline wide. Yeah, borderline. Yeah. Okay. And so there's kind of this bundle branch block pattern, right bundle pattern in V1. Sure. And out in the lateral leads, you see that wide S. So there's a uh, at least an incomplete right bundle. I don't know exactly what the QRS is. If it's less than 120, you call it incomplete. If it's greater than 120, you call it complete. Sure. But yeah, so short QT. Um, and sometimes the QT can be so short that T wave kind of fuses with the QRS complex and creates the appearance of some ST elevations, which I think you kind of see a little bit of yeah, in v, a lot v3 of the leads here. Yeah, V3 primarily, I think you see that. Yeah. And so in this patient with a history of lung cancer, what are you thinking? Uh, my concern would be for a metabolic arrangement like hypercalcemia, specifically with that history in the CCG. Cool. Yeah. And so we get these EKGs all the time from triage and paints. It would not be uncommon in a 63 year old guy that presented with dizziness just to have gotten an ECG with nothing else, no other information other than knowing that he's 63, he has dizziness and you have this ECG and that would suggest just based on the ECG alone that this patient has a metabolic disturbance. He has hypercalcemia. So I think that's really cool that we can pick that up just on the ECG alone before we have any labs or anything back. Yeah, totally agree. And I think that would be a reason to potentially bring this guy back, you know, more quickly than, than normal. Yeah. What, let's, so this guy did end up having confirmed hypercalcemia. I think his calcium was like 17. Sure. Um, so what, what are the steps in management for this patient? So initially, my, my initial step in management is to, is to hydrate this guy, give him some fluids. Um, that's usually our first step in the ED, um, and, it's, and it's continued uh, by the inpatient teams typically after that. Yeah, fluids, fluids, fluids. Yeah, secondary steps, you can start considering things like bisphosphonates, um, calcitonin. Um, Steroids. Yeah. I believe furosemide is no longer recommended. You kind of chase your tail a little bit. You're trying to hydrate them because they get dehydrated so easily because they're hypercalcemia, and then you give them diuretics. So uh, I would probably try to avoid the loop diuretics, even though that will lower the calcium. Yep. Okay, cool case. Yeah, good one. All right, what do you think about this one? 67-year-old gentleman who came in for chest pain. Okay, the rate looks normal to me. There is a P for every QRS, QRS for every P. It's a sinus rhythm. The axis appears normal. It's up in one in ADF. The intervals all look pretty normal. And then in terms of signs of ischemia, nothing jumps out at me super aggressively, but I do notice a couple things that could be early findings of ischemia. The first is if you look in AVL, there's an impressive T wave inversion hmm. in AVL. And sometimes that could be the first finding of inferior ischemia is you get a flipped T and hopefully you have an old one to compare to, but if you don't that in, and you presume that that's a new flipped T in AVL, you may be worried about some inferior, some pending inferior changes. So if you have this ECG and you got someone that you're worried about, uh, what should we do? Get another ECG. Definitely. Uh, so that's what we ended up doing. But before we go to the next one, I do want to point out another thing. If you look in the inferior leads, these T waves, I mean, they don't look huge, but relative to the size of the QRS complex, I think they are pretty big. In fact, if you look in three, it's almost like you could fit that QRS complex under the roof of the T wave, like as if the T wave were a house for the QRS complex. And the same could almost be said of the one in AVF as well. So maybe there's some hyperacute changes in the inferior lead. So hyperacute T waves and this T wave version AVL all making me pretty worried about a, a pending AMI in the inferior wall. Yeah, totally agree. Let's go to the next one. Boom! Found it. All right, nailed it. So one of the things I find most impressive about this was this was submitted by one of our new attendings, who's actually a new grad from our program, who called this based on the first ECG. I'm proud. Very I'm proud. tearing up a little bit. Very, very proud. He, I feel like we had everything to do with that. I, I'm going to take 
complete credit. I think the two of us can take complete credit for that. So what happened when he called it? Did they say, no, not yet? They didn't think that it would met STEMI criteria just yet, um, but they came to evaluate the patient. And in the meantime, as they walked down to evaluate the patient, he repeated the ECG uh, and found this second ECG and the patient was whisked away to the cath lab for uh, his PCI. Yeah, it's always cool to see these evolving changes, especially if you get them early enough to see those initial ischemic changes and you feel really good about yourself when you call him. And I feel good about him. I'm really proud. All right, until next time. We'll see you next time.